So hello everyone, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Um, welcome to this discussion about Belarus and the upcoming elections. There, my name is Marilia Huscha. I'm a um, research assistant at the International Institute for Peace in Vienna. And I would like to welcome three excellent speakers to our panel today who are joining us from Minsk and from London. Um, we'll be talking today for about an hour. Uh, you will have a lot of room to ask questions, so please, um, you can submit them in the Q&A form um, here on Zoom, or if you're watching us on um, Facebook, please submit them in the comment section there. Also check from time. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> without further ado, I would like to start with our first speaker, Rihora Stapenia who is a Robert Bosch Stiftung Academy Fellow at Chatham House, and he's also research director uh, of the Belarusian think tank Center for New Ideas. Um, so Rigor will tell us a little bit about the um, electoral campaign, the current process, and um, maybe like a very basic question for the beginning is um, that as we, most of us probably know, elections in Belarus are usually characterized by protests and detentions and arrests and everything what's been happening in the past months. So um, why, what's the big deal this year? Has anything changed or it's just um, all the same as always? Rehor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marila. Good evening, everyone. I guess that everyone who works in media or think tanks at some point of their careers have to cover some events that seems very unique, but in practice, in the long term, they're just like one of the many. But this election, it really feels different. And I will unpack this with four key points about changes in domestic politics. First of all, today Lukashenko's approval rating is very low. While he has hit the statistical lows before, it never happened during the presidential election. And it feels like a part of a long-term trend rather than temporary occurrence. And an official state-funded poll from April showed that 24% of Minsk dwellers trusted him. Although the capital of Belarus is, of course, more opposition-minded, I think that electoral rating of Lukashenko across the country is somewhat close to this figure. Probably Lukashenko's in, inadequate response to COVID-19 and a wave of massive repressions are unlikely to contribute to his unpopularity. And his unpopularity is explained simply by the fact that he is no longer able to deliver things that he delivered previously. For example, during the last 10 years, wages in Belarus stagnated. Like in 2010, the, the monthly average salary was around $500 and, and still the same. So, and being unable to deliver economic growth, he's also seen as a person who was unable to take adequate measures uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, Belarusian citizens just like felt being alone and feeling that the state should just couldn't care less about the common people, about the well-being of common people, as actually the state did very little to support businesses and people. The second important change is that there is a strong involvement of citizens in politics. In June, public actions on larger or smaller scale took place across the whole country and even in towns with some 10,000 inhabitants. There are like a few reasons why the scale of people's involvement has increased. People protest not only because they are disappointed uh, about Lukashenko, with Lukashenko, but also because there is an, an entire generation that grew up without massive large-scale repressions. The last large-scale crackdown happened in 2010, and uh, although smaller waves of repressions took place after that, they, they were still smaller than, than, than in 2010. So some people are not afraid. Well, at least they were not afraid a month ago uh, of being involved in politics. Actually, it's kind of a natural feature of Belarusian politics. When repressions decrease, the protests become crowded. 
One more reason for people's great involvement is the appearance of a new opposition um, candidates, leaders, as uh, Viktor Babarik, as uh, Sergei Tsikhanovsky, as uh, Valery Tsipkala. Uh, these people are outsiders of the traditional opposition, so they are perceived as kind of more successful than usual opposition leaders. And one more reason for people's great involvement is a change of media landscape. Non-state media and social media now more popular than ever before. And actually, censorship of state media is not a, no longer a problem for is no longer a huge problem for for opposition uh, candidates because they can reach the society through their own channels. For example, Viktor Babarika has almost three hundred thousand. Uh, followers on Instagram. Uh, Sergei Tsikhanovsky has almost 250,000 uh, subscribers on YouTube. So thanks to technologies, people can better self-organize, they can financially mobilize to pay fines or just like organize street, act, street actions or just like write angry comments together. Uh, the appearance of new alternative candidates is the third change that I should mention. Uh, Victor Bobarica previously headed Belarus branch of Gazprom Bank, and he is currently a leading candidate. He announced his plan to participate in the election just uh, one week before the uh, before the deadline of registration of initiative groups. And after that, in a, in a month, he collected almost half a million signatures without significant financial resources. And it's like it would be a huge political success in any European country. So, but, but since the middle of June, he is on the jail on the account of economic charges, which are very likely to be falsified. The second important candidate is Valery Tsepkala, who was a regime insider uh, until 2017. He's a creator of the high-tech park, which is basically an economic uh, zone with preferential uh, tax conditions for IT companies. It is the only economic success that Belarus had, have had in the in recent years. And uh, when, for example, foreign politicians like Mike Pompeo, or German members of parliament, when they came to Belarus this year, they actually visited the high tech park since no other projects come closer to the success of this park. The third remarkable candidate is Svetlana Tsikhanovska, the wife of a jailed political blogger Sergei Tsikhanovsky, and Sergei represents probably the angriest Belarusians who are angry with their uh, level of life. The fourth significant change is the lack of any positive agenda of Lukashenko. He currently promises nothing except keeping things the way they are. His recent appointments also show that the, the authorities do not plan to have any uh, changes in Belarusian economy in June. Sergei Rumas, a uh, relatively economic liberal, uh, left his post of prime minister, and uh, Roman Galochenko, a security officer, uh, took this position. So, this lack of positive agenda is to some extent related to the tactics of the authorities for this election that. Political repression will remain the main uh, political tool for uh, for suppressing the popular vote. As uh, one candidate and two heads of initiative groups are already in prison, another two dozen people have already been recognized as political prisoners by human rights organizations. Hundreds of people uh, have received politically motivated administrative uh, RS, more than 200 received politically motivated fines. So it seems very likely that on the 9th of August, that people who will come out to protest, that they will face um, brutal police force. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rihor. Um, maybe a very short question um, right straight to you. So one of the attendees in the registration form uh, submitted a question. It was probably a Belarusian person since the question actually uh, is very simple. Um, 
it sounds like what can be done actually against this, especially on the election day, against these falsifications in the electoral commissions. Also, we already know that the electoral commissions uh, have already been formed. And the percentage, I think, of uh, independent uh, members of those commissions is something below zero, right? Uh, so is there like a real change to somehow, uh, you know, for people to give their vote really for the candidate that they have been voting for? Um, what can be done? Well, I think that as every citizen, people come, can become election observers during the election day and they can come to the election poll and just check how the electoral commission uh, just counting their votes. I was personally, I was like three, four times when I was an election observer and once it was very, very transparent. So I think that if people will come to the election points, I do not think that all votes will be falsified. Thank you, thank you for giving some hope <laughs> also, despite uh, all the previous remarks. Um, I would like to turn now to Katerina Barnukova, who is the academic director at Berok Economic Research Center in Minsk. And Katerina will talk a little bit about the uh, Belarusian economy, how it has developed throughout the years and uh, where we are standing today. So Katerina, the floor is yours. Uh, I think you're also sharing uh, yeah. PowerPoint with us. Ah, uh, yes. Well, thank you, Marilia. Since I'm the economist, I will torture you with some slides. Um, so the first slide that I want to show you basically shows uh, the whole picture, everything that you need to know about the state of the Belarusian economy right now. Uh, you see in this picture the GDP growth rate, and you see that if in 2000s, uh, GDP growth rate was quite high in Belarus, and uh, this growth was actually pro-poor, uh, so that the poverty and inequality rates uh, went down and everyone was very happy about it. But uh, 2010s are, well, they became a lost decade for the economy of Belarus. Growth rates were stagnating and Belarus was an increasing uh, gap uh, in the incomes levels with its uh, more successful neighbors. And you see that in 2020, what we have projected is minus 4%. Uh, percent GDP. This is the deepest decline in, in the last 25 years we're looking for. So uh, what happened? Let me try to uh, explain very quickly at least the two major reasons. One of them is our very big dependence on the Russian economy, uh, which is very multidimensional. Uh, first of all, uh, well, what you see in this graph is uh, the growth rates of Belarus and Russia, and you see that largely they pretty much moved together. Uh, and of course, Russian recent Russian economic slowdown uh, has led Belarus to slow down as well. And um, what is the source of this dependence? First of all, this is oil and gas subsidies, uh, implicit subsidies that we get by uh, getting lower uh, than the market prices for oil and gas. Uh, these subsidies are decreasing in the recent years, which also causes uh, uh, drops in uh, growth for us, but they used to be quite high, uh, sometimes reaching 20% of GDP. Uh, the second uh, very important point is that Russia is our main market, especially for the non-rent non export. Uh, Russia is also funding our government debt. Currently, Russia and uh, associated uh, funds uh, hold about 50% of our public debt. And our labor markets are integrated within the Eurasian Economic Union so that uh, many Belarusians actually work on the Russian labor market. Another structural problem is the efficiency of state-owned enterprises. Uh, state, commercial state-owned enterprises, they comprise quite a significant share of Belarusian economy because of uh, the lack of reforms and privatization. Uh, and... Uh, what happened is that we see currently we see the uh, share of employment in state-owned enterprises uh, shrinking from 37% to only 29% of employment in 2019. So what happened, uh, they were growing quickly in, 2000, in 2000s and in the beginning of 2010s, uh, the government was injecting a lot of money through direct, directed lending and modernization schemes, uh, but it was not efficient and didn't give a lot of results, but instead these uh, enterprises and the government accumulated a lot of debt. And right now, uh, 
they used to play a huge social role. So a lot of redistribution actually went through the state-owned enterprises offering, you know, well-paid jobs to, to the people, uh, especially in the depressed regions. But now this social role is fading away and there is no replacement uh, emerging. Uh, and the result of that is growth in inequality, uh, no matter how you slice it. So what I'm going to show you here is just the regional aspect of inequality, but uh, there are other aspects as well. Uh, so what you see here is average wages in regions relative to uh, those uh, of the capital city of Minsk. So Minsk is 100%. And you see that if, again, in the very good years, the gap was just... 20-30% uh, between Minsk and the rest of the regions. After the recent crisis of 2015-16, uh, the gap has increased quite dramatically and now it's 35-40% uh, between Minsk and less successful regions. Of course, this makes people very unhappy about the existing um, economic model. And what happens is that people actually change their views about the, the economy. Well, not only about the economy, but I'll let my colleagues speak to that. But what we see in surveys is that in the last 10 years, the share of market supporters actually doubled. So people believe much more in uh, pro-market or at least partial pro-market reforms, and there are less socialists. Uh, and the last slide is about the current state of the economy. So we entered 2020 with a very weak growth potential, even before uh, all the bad things that happened to us in 2020. The outlook was like very weak growth of 1-2% uh, during the year. We also entered the um, year with a large debt to serve. It's not so large per se, but it's very expensive for us to uh, serve and repay. Uh, and this year we were supposed to, for the first time in history, to have budget deficit. And we will have it surely because, you know, because of COVID, first of all. Uh, then we also, in the beginning of the year, we had oil conflict with Russia. And mean, that means that Right now, we have no oil or gas subsidies from Russia. And actually, since we're paying the gas price above the market, it's probably Belarus, which is now subsidizing Russia, not the other way around. Uh, and then we also have the COVID-19 pandemic. Yes, we didn't have the lockdown. Uh, but, you know, um, uh, first of all, the service uh, sector still uh, suffered because people uh, were imposing self-isolation on them. And then we have a very open economy where experts is a huge part of the economy and uh, through experts our economy was hurt. And right now 55% of Belarusians uh, report uh, some kinds of income losses, either through, through loss of employment or through unpaid uh, vacations, etc., etc. And still we have no meaningful social support. Uh, so uh, as I told you before, the state-owned enterprises played the role of social support. Now they're incapable to do so. And we basically, we have no functioning system of, uh, for example, unemployment insurance or uh, means-tested support, right? And why this happened? Well, because why this continues to happen? Because our budget revenues right now are down 26% in May relative to last year. So, well, this is the picture that we currently have of the economy, very slow growth, very, um, well, negative growth perspectives for this year. Uh, and huge pressure right now on the banking system to, you know, to fund the economy, which could result in uh, a financial stress. Thank you very much for this uh, quick overview. Um, maybe also a short question to you. Um, so you mentioned that there is also externally, there is a conflict with Russia. Um, there is little um, somehow internal resources that government can draw on to support the situation, the current situation. Um, how do you see it developing in the next months? So are there any sort of hidden tools that the authorities still have to, you know, um, somehow support the system or at least uh, demonstrate to the population that they still, you know, um, to basically to reestablish their trust in, in how the system has been run before? Or do you see that this current situation, the pandemic, um, will foster also economic reforms that you also mentioned people are more supportive of right now? 
Um, I think at the moment we have uh, no indication for you know economic reforms starting anytime soon. Instead, the rhetoric has become even more traditionalist in a way. Uh, so it's we are trying to do more of the same. Uh, so the government is actually quite successful in uh, uh, smoothing out the shock from COVID. Uh, so uh, we have all these state-owned enterprises producing much more than the demand. So the, the, their inventory stocks are growing, but at the same time they are able, you know, to keep at least some level of employment and wages. But this is, you know, this is our traditional approach, and that just means that economic decline would would not be as uh, deep, but it would be more prolonged than for many other countries, right? Um, and what we see again right now is a huge pressure on the national bank to, well, to put it in, you know, regular terms, to basically print money and fund the. Uh, uh, support the economy, uh, the real sector through through lending, through the increased lending, and we see the national bank is already putting pressure on the banking system to increase the lending, and this is uh, not painting well for the financial stability because it's very uh, fragile in the sense that, well, for example, most of our government debt is uh, in a foreign currency. So what we might have from this increased lending is inflation, devaluation, and increased uh, burden of the government debt. Thank you. Um, I would like to also remind our viewers that they can submit their questions in the Q&A form on Zoom as well as uh, in the comment section on Facebook. And uh, But before turning to those questions, I would also like to give the floor to Artem Scheidman, uh, our third speaker today, uh, who will speak a little bit more about the foreign policy of Belarus and uh, how it also plays into the current electoral, electoral campaign. We already heard from uh, previous speakers that uh, there is some uh, conflict with Russia, that there is also, um, as Rehor said, there, there are also protests and detentions, which... Um, of course, will not be welcome uh, in the West either. Um, how do you see um, how do you see foreign policy actually uh, impact uh, the elections and the other way around? What will the foreign policy be after the elections are over? Great, thank you for for having me. Thank you, Marilla. It's a pleasure to speak. I think for the for the third time already in the International Institute of Peace. Um, and that's that's very delightful. Um, on the foreign policy implications, I need to start with a small, let's say, very basic, uh, not a disclaimer necessarily, but the framing of this. Uh, it is a mistake to think that foreign policy uh, considerations are even somewhat important for the decision makers during the election period uh, in Belarus. Um, of course, People hold somewhere. I mean, people who make decisions hold the foreign policy implications somewhere at the back of their heads. They think of what will um, will be the fallout of their actions, but it never actually, as we see now, as we saw previous at the previous times, it never actually changes their course or modifies their course. What is essential is a domestic uh, dynamic. Uh, people like Vladimir Mackey, foreign minister, and others who in other circumstances would be the, so to say, rational voice at the table, the ones who will convince the decision makers, Lukashenko and others, to, to soften their approach, are now actually work, work in another mode. They are basically tasked with uh, alleviating the or mitigating the risk, the, the, the reputational damages, but not listened to as the advisors of how to manage and or rather how to administer the, the process and how to to crack down on the uh, protests uh, and other political activity. With this in mind, I think that, uh, of course, given the level of crackdown, given the intensity and, the, and how early the crackdown started, there is virtually no way of Belarusian US or Belarusian EU relations to be improved after their like, elections. I mean, this is probably the obvious, the obvious uh, point. Um, now the question is, how deep will uh, the setback uh, be after the election? And uh, it definitely depends on what will happen before the election day, 
during the election day, and most importantly, after the election day? Will we have a crackdown akin to what we've had in 2010? Will it be harder? Or will government be effective in uh, preventing uh, the, uh, this culmination of protest on one day uh, and therefore be not forced to uh, you know, deal with it in the traditional manner at one day? Um, will there be political prisoners after election uh, for, let's say, more than several months? Or uh, will the government, be, will the uh, law enforcement, the, the, the decision makers be satisfied with how the crackdown went? And so the political prisoners could, in this circumstance, be swiftly released. Uh, all these questions are now open, and I can't actually, this beyond my capacities of prediction to, to speculate about what will happen. Uh, on the election night and after this. Uh, but uh, in any way, I think sanctions, uh, return to the sanctions policy uh, that we witnessed um, six, seven years ago is highly unlikely. Um, for To trigger, I mean, first of all, the bar for sanctions uh, introdu introduction has been uh, increased. Uh, first of all, due, due to geopolitics, um, because nobody... I mean, with the level of confrontation in, in Belarus-Russia relations, there is this widespread perception in Western capitals that any attempt to isolate Belarus will force it into the embrace of Vladimir Putin. And therefore, it makes any sanction-like moves very, uh, you know, uh, psychologically costly for, for European and U.S. decision makers. Nobody wants to be held responsible for I don't know, another Crimea-like uh, situation in, in the Eastern Europe. Uh, secondly, there is a very serious inertia, a conservatism in the decision-making apparatus in Brussels and Washington as well, in terms of uh, negating or uh, basically dismantling the progress achieved in the last five years, because to introduce sanctions would uh, mean that the work of many, of tens, maybe hundreds of people, politicians, diplomats, will be nullified. And of course, Minsk will be responsible for this, but still there is a human desire not to, to throw your work into the trash bin. Uh, and that is why uh, I expect that just having political prisoners after the election or just having the repetition of 2010 um, uh, street crackdown would be not enough for sanctions reintroduction. The Russian government will have to perform something much more brutal and horrendous to get to the proper isolation mode. Uh, however, uh, despite, the, despite the fact that I don't believe that sanctions will, will probably um, follow, even in the absence of sanctions, there will be some degradation of relations. Um, I, think, I, I, I see, think that it will happen on three main, let's say, dimensions. First of all, financially. Um, it, it would be hard for Western decision makers to uh, issue various loans, even small loans, even technical assistance, various relief funds, even if it's done via the in, in, if economic institutions like IMF or the World Bank, uh, just after the election, after the crackdown, after the restrictive conduct of the campaign, because it will be basically seen as something that encourages this sort of behavior. That is why I think that uh, those who were maybe thinking of of, of new assistance program will think twice and probably will put them on hold and new programs will likely not be coming. I'm, we are probably looking at the, some sort of curtailing or at, least li or at least limiting of EBRD and European investment bank activities in Belarus as well in the worst case scenario or in the, one of the worst case scenarios. The second dimension where the relations probably will worsen, I mean, between Belarus and the collective West, is diplomatically. Uh, the level of contacts will be diminished, and not just because there will be some sanctions or some, I don't know, ban on speaking with Lukashenko, but simply because it will be reputationally challenging for uh, Western leaders to speak with Lukashenko just as though nothing has happened. So I think we'll be back to the ministerial level of dialogue, uh, Minister McKay would probably be, uh, or whoever, I don't know, will be the chief diplomat if McKay some, on some day is out. Um, so this will be the highest level of regular contact. Probably Lukashenko will stop being invited to Brussels uh, 
uh, on the European Partnership uh, Eastern Partnership summits since he still doesn't doesn't go there. And I cannot imagine that many high-level European visits will take place to to Belarus after the restrictive uh, campaign. But I think that the third dimension of deterioration of relations is even more strategically uh, negative or strategically um, unfortunate. It is in terms of the potential, in terms of the ceiling, in terms of the bar, because uh, more and more people in Brussels, in Berlin, in Vienna, in Washington will understand that with the current regime in Belarus, with the current uh, incumbent, it is simply impossible to build a diplomatic career on Belarus. And uh, then why to care? Why to invest your energy? Why to invest your time, your efforts to try to make, to come up with some elaborate schemes of engaging Belarus despite its at human rights record? And this frustration, this lack of enthusiasm will be, I think, uh, qualitatively increased on, on the election day and after. Uh, it will probably be that we will probably get into the situation where virtually no one cares to engage Belarus um, uh, meaningfully, and um, it will be just some sort of a diplomatic limbo for 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 Minsk. Uh, and uh, to unfro unfreeze it, to get back to normal, uh, I cannot imagine that some temporary interim liberalization will be enough, uh, because everybody has already seen this game being played many times. Uh, with the U.S., uh, it's an open question for me whether the ambassador will come if we witness if we will witness some brutal crackdown to continue continuing, if the political prisoners will be there. Because to arrive uh, at the midst of this uh, crackdown just before the election would be, you know, seemingly encouraging of this behavior, encouraging of this behavior, and the same would be the perception if the ambassador arrives right after the election. So probably this decision will have to be postponed. Unless uh, until the situation somehow stabilizes politically, um, again for Minsk it would be definitely definitely harder to position itself as this neutral mediator venue for peace talks and various peacemaking activities due to the increased toxicity. Uh, there is no other way to describe it. Minsk, uh, Alexander Lukashenko will be more toxic after this election to engage with, and this is hard to pre to present yourself as the ultimate Eastern European Switzerland when you have a human rights record of, I don't know, uh, Uzbekistan. So it's, it's really, um, it will be really challenging to, you know, trying to find um, opportunities to present your image in another way as Minsk successfully did three, four years ago after the, uh, it's uh, Ukraine talks uh, in endeavor. Uh, for, uh, on Russia, uh, on the uh, relations with Russia, very briefly, uh, I think that there is a widespread perception in the West, in Europe, uh, in, in the US as well, that if relations between M Minsk and Brussels or Minsk in, and the West are deteriorating, that Lukashenko will be basically forced to crawl on his knees to Moscow and to beg for some, I mean, assistance, some urgent relief, and will do anything Putin will ask him to do. I think this is a misperception. I don't share this logic um, because um, this is based on a very, I, I would say, slippery argument that Lukashenko somehow cannot survive without either West or Russia being supportive of him. This is the very uh, simplistic, I think, perception because uh, if he's um, successful in suppressing this political activity, uh, even if I mean, even if it costs him reputationally, but if he is successful in preserving political stability in the country, there is no immediate political challenge for him from within coming just because uh, the salaries are becoming smaller or just because wages are falling or just because uh, the GDP is not growing. Um, I think that given the con given the conditions that currently are in place, and we all know these condition, conditions from Russia, it is basically the deeper integration. This was not removed from the table. And this 31 roadmaps, everybody understands where it goes. Everybody in Minsk, in Moscow, understands that the underlying idea behind it is some sort of deprivation of Belarus of sovereignty. And uh, given that, this... Con uh, 
con conditions are simply undigestible for Lukashenko, no matter what is on the other side of this equation. Therefore, um, I think that he will probably rely more on firm um, freezing of the country's political situation, on trying to manage and administer the poverty in the country, on hoping that the borders will be open and the um, labor markets of the neighboring countries will somehow absorb the people who uh, were deprived of their jobs in Belarus due to this crisis. Uh, but joining Russia or becoming part of any sort of union state with Russia, which is more than the union state we have now, is not an option. It is simply out of the table for Lukashenko. And this has to be understood. Um, I think that there is definitely no room for breakthrough in relations with Russia. I'm, I'm coming to the, to, the, to the end. It's just a couple of, a couple of sentences. No room from, from breakthrough. But there are still plenty of causes and reasons for possible uh, quarrels in the uh, coming months. And gas is one of them. We are, as Katerina said, we are overpaying on gas now. Gazprom is refusing to lower this price. And we are now uh, going down in this, into this escalation spiral of relations with Gazprom uh, when we basically seize control of Gazprom-owned bank in Belarus, which is, was run by Mr. Babarika, and uh, underpaying for Russian gas starting from this year. So this is probably will be likely the first election in the in Belarusian recent history, after which we will not witness some zero-sum foreign policy uh, outcome, where either the relations with Russia get improved and the relations with the West get, uh, you know, uh, deteriorated or other way around. Probably we'll witness some sort of the lose-lose scenario where the relations with the West will get worse and the relations with Russia will remain stagnant as they are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Artyom. You basically covered all the possible vectors and scenarios. Um, I will try maybe also already now integrate some questions that we received from the audience um, to what you said. Um, so, uh, one question concerns is, is sort of a, a questioning the approach of the West towards Belarus, and the question is whether you think that West is really does really care that much about democracy in Belarus, since many Western countries um, have also very um, you know questionable questionable record. And maybe my own comment to that is also that uh, months ago, Viktor Orban was in Minsk, uh, Hungarian prime minister, and he actually declared that he wants all the sanctions that are still, uh, you know, in place against Belarus. He wants them all lifted. Um, so how do you see that? And also uh, about the sanctions, there is another question from Jonathan Millins um, from University of Antwerp. He is asking whether... Uh, whether you see that even uh, the EU, even when the EU does not impose economic sanctions on Belarus, is it possible that they reimpose travel financial sanctions on specific individuals? So if you can cover it somehow together, the sanctions and then um, the democratic, uh, the democratic uh, record of Belarus and how the West sees it. Well, uh, sorry, I, I didn't hear the first part of the first question. There was some gl uh, glitch in the sound uh, about the democratic record. I just heard starting from the Orban part. So I'll probably answer the sanctions bit, and then I'll ask you to briefly rephrase it. Or write it in the chat section, I will read it. Um, on the um, sanctions and the likelihood of visa sanctions or targeted sanctions instead of economic sanctions, but EU has not imposed economic sanctions on Belarus in the last um, in the last ten years. So this has not been the case. Apart from the arms embargo, if we consider this an economic sanction, uh, all the sanctions that were in place against uh, Minsk uh, in 2011 were uh, targeted visa and asset visa ban and asset freeze. So this is considered to be the toughest of the of, of, of the of the of what European Union has in, in its toolkit. So I don't think that we will just jump over this level to economic sanctions. This is, I think, is just beyond. I mean, this is just not 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 visible. Uh, and I was basically speaking about the return to the sanctions uh, that existed, and I don't think that it is likely because any sanctions policy is too. Um, everybody understands that uh, it's easy to impose sanctions, but it's very hard to remove them. And so everybody understands what is the diplomatic and 
uh, political cost of introducing even even the lightest of the light uh, diplomatic sanctions, let's say, against Lukashenko or his his closest uh, subordinates. So I don't think we'll be getting there because uh, uh, again, of all, because of all the factors I've, I've mentioned, uh, the sanctions policy, if it is activated, it probably will be activated due to some some new level of brutality that I cannot even fathom, to be perfectly honest. Uh, on the uh, question about the uh, democratic, um, what is serious about democratic democracy in Belarus? Well, uh, Hungary and Poland may, may, may also be added to this list. Well, there is also uh, there is always a double standard with regard to to sanctions in the world. I mean, European Union has never treated Belarus like it treated Azerbaijan or China or Saudi Arabia or you name it, or Kazakhstan. Um, Belarus was always held to to uh, another set of standards. The fact that Hungary domestically has problems in human rights, uh, with human rights, I don't think will uh, lower the appetite or lower the enthusiasm of of, of um, those who are concerned with with human rights uh, in Belarus. To, to be less concerned of them. I just think that other factors like geopolitics, like uh, inertia will intervene uh, before. Uh, I think that uh, Brussels, if, uh, if anything would be uh, rich on statements, there will be many statements coming on uh, with, with regards to, to Belarusian human rights situation. But to imagine that because of problems domestically, it will somehow be mitigated I don't think it works just this in this linear way because the decision making is in, in the EU is not as you know centralized in in, in one uh, cabinet so to say in one in one room one people deal with Hungary other set of people deal with eastern neighborhood that is why I don't see it in this factor. Thank you, Artyom. Um, there was also another question for Ihor um, concerning um, concerning your statement about uh, Viktor Babarika. Uh, so you stated that the charges against Viktor Babarika uh, are very likely to be falsified. So do you have any supporting evidence for this claim? As uh, David, uh, who is asking this question, yeah. uh, is saying that many uh, many former high flying businessmen um, were in a similar situation. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Well, I should probably start from the fact that he is not an idiot. I, I'm just sorry for saying that, but if you're living in Belarus, everyone in Belarus understands that if you're doing something illegally, you you, will, you shouldn't run for a president, for being the president, because it's very stupid that you will be like caged and you will be in prison soon. So I do not think that he was doing something illegal and then decided to stand for a presidency. The second, my point, that his bank was audited many times by National Bank, by Gazprom Bank, by Gazprom, who are uh, owners of his bank he, he managed previously. It was audited by external organizations. So I do not think that if this organization couldn't find anything, I do not think that Belarusian law enforcement agencies was able to, do, to find anything. And probably the third point is that actually there is no evidence that he is guilty, although Belarusian state television said that he, he is guilty. Belarusian like law enforcement ad agencies, they say that he is guilty, but they are not giving any evidence for that. And that's very weird. I hope that was useful. Thank you, Rihor. Um, there is also a question to Katerina from Ben Chalice from the European Leadership Network. I will quickly read it. Uh, how Belarus can manage the tension between the need for market reforms and the social role played by an unsustainable state sector? Can you also say a little on the likelihood and impact of the fiscal crisis given mounting debt? Mm. So... I don't see any tension between the role of uh, the social role of uh, state-owned enterprises and um, uh, and reforms, possible reforms. Why? Because the social role of state-owned enterprises is basically already gone. This is why we are experiencing the problems we are experiencing politically. 
so they are unable to perform the social role and there is a vacuum which is not filled by any other policies. Uh, as for the fiscal crisis, uh, it's well, there is a possibility which is difficult right now to, um, to quantify because it will depend on many different policies, but this possibility is not immediate. So we have uh, some money in the reserves which will allow us to sustain for at least a year, maybe two, right? Um, then time will show what happens. All right. Um, we also got a question on Facebook, um, which refers to Lukashenko's plan to keep a Switzerland status of Belarus. I guess it refers to sort of this mediation position between uh, or the bridge between Russia and the West. Um, and whether whether this approach of Lukashenko is popular in Belarus uh, among among the population, and whether this this short sort of approach shared. Uh, by some of the opposition leaders uh, or the independent candidates. Uh, whoever wants to answer this question first, Artem, go ahead. Well, I'd say that it is popular because any poll you take, if you don't ask the binary question of where would you like to be in the Union with Russia or in the European Union, if you add some other colors to this question, like the option of neutrality or the option of not being in any alliances, non-aligned status, Immediately, these medium uh, non-aligned options immediately are on the first place on public sympathies. So Belarusians naturally lean towards more neutral-like status of their country, more non-alignment, and therefore any shift of the governmental foreign policy to towards this non-alignment is welcomed. And uh, currently, if you, which is very interesting and I, I would say symptomatic, that currently at this campaign, if we look at the top uh, three or even all the candidates that remain now formally in the race, even the jailed ones, even Blogger Tikhanovsky, uh, even Viktor Babarika, all of them postulate and advance the idea that Belarus should be kind of neutral, non-aligned, uh, which is the other side of this peaceful peacemaker, peace donor, and mediator. And uh, this issue, I think, is uh, getting close to being a national consensus in Belarus. Only people on fringes, on pro-Russian fringe and pro-Western fringe, would disagree that Belarus uh, should, should be something other than uh, this neutral Eastern European Switzerland. Uh, so on this, I think governmental foreign policy is popular. However, uh, popularity among the public is not enough to sustain it. Uh, to be Eastern European Switzerland, you first a need to be, you know, needed. Anybody, uh, people, act, uh, you know, actors and foreign and geopolitical actors and foreign powers need need to need you first. And there is no immediate demand for uh, a lot of uh, peace uh, keeping efforts from Belarus uh, at the moment. Uh, and secondly, you have to have some less, some, some of a less toxic reputation that Belarus is. Uh, getting these days. Thank you. Anyone else who wants to add on that? No? All right, then uh, there is another question um, coming from Mr. Murphy. Uh, is an article, uh, in an article entitled Yad Lukashenko's crackdown on independent voices, EU observer reported on 7th of July that courts never side with journalists in Belarus. Only 0.2% of cases result in uh, acquittal, uh, for example. How does the general public living in Belarus perceive journalists? Is there, is there admiration for the work they do, given the risks they face? Uh, maybe, Rihor, you can say something on that. Thank you. Well, I guess Artom is, was a journalist very recently, and he will also add something. But generally speaking, I think that Belarusians do not see journalists as someone doing very extreme job. They see them, of course, it's very unique job, but I don't think that people look at journalists with some kind of admiration. And so generally... The, they, it's very 
Interesting, because actually, I think that approach that how Belarusians see journalists depends on the situation in the country. Because, for example, during the protests, during the um, political campaigns, journalists become now very important. And many people see them like as, uh, as quasi-politicians in a way. Uh, that, for example, during protests, people with cameras, journalists with cameras, are perceived as uh, like kind of leaders of uh, of protests. For example, Sergei Tsikhanovsky actually became very popular because he actually used his camera. He just came to people with camera and people see him as a quasi-journalist, quasi-leader of the opposition. So it's very, very interesting. But I do not think that actually Belarusians think too much about journalists. Thank you for your answer. Uh, there is also a question maybe uh, to all of you. You can maybe cover it from uh, one side or another. Um, do you see any reasons for optimism? And uh, for example, any chances that opposition can win, take power and consequences of that for human rights and for economy? Or in case uh, of Lukashenko's victory, uh, what are the chances that he will incorporate better policies, liberalization reforms and so forth? Who wants to start? Any chance for optimism? No one wishes to start. <laughs> All right. Um, no, I, I, I can start. I, well, you, can, you, you should be very inquisitive, of course, to, to find reasons for optimism in, this, uh, in these developments that we are describing. But I think there, are, there may be some midterm. Uh, first of all, uh, I think that given that Lukashenko will, if he is, I mean, successfully, if he successfully retains his power, which apparently no one is doubting here, he will still have to produce some positive agenda to, to, to his public, to public, to the people. And as Rigor has rightly pointed out, uh, and as Katerina has pointed out as well, the economic agenda is basically out of the window. He does not even try to promise any meaningful economic either reform or deliver deliverables. Uh, so he will probably have to speed up his idea of revising the constitution. I'm not saying that we will get some sort of a democratic constitution. I will I don't, I don't even suggest that it will be some sort of real um, shift of powers within the system. He will still run the country after this in the end. However, any change of the constitution in such a system as Belarus is uh, adding some sort of dynamism in the, in the system, at least in the midterm perspective. So uh, I think that these events probably will force him to speed up this process, and he already showed signs of doing so, because in the last year when he spoke of the constitution uh, revision or re review uh, or update, he spoke of the five-year deadline, so we will do it by 2024. But this year, when Mr. Babarika, being in jail, uh, his team published his pre-recorded video of him calling for a referendum on a new constitution, and his team started to gather people into the team to hold this referendum, uh, Lukashenko went public in a week, and several times within the next week, he said that we will hold the referendum, or we will rather they present the new constitution now in two years. So before 2022. So I think this will, might be some, some, sort of, some sort of a stimulus or incentive for him to move on. I think that um, it will probably be in the long term very, it might be refreshing for many um, Belarusians because uh, the less is the support rate of Lukashenko uh, now and the less it will be in the time he departs the fewer people will be nostalgic about these times in his times in office and his methods of governance. So if, if he manages to irritate, to frustrate his yesterday's electorate, we will probably get some some more solid and sustainable support for other more reformist policies in post Lukashenko Belarus. This is very long term, I don't know, thinking. Currently as answering your questions briefly in the short term, I don't see any reasons for optimism. 
All right. I will just yeah. yeah I will just probably add two cents here that well, why this campaign is pretty different is that it will not end in in August. It's very likely that it will continue because of the Babarika's plan to hold this referendum. So that's why this the campaign is still will be going. So and the position will still have some chances to at least publicly something to participate in politics. Well, at least politics will be will exist in Belarus. So it's it I it's I think it's very very unique comparing with previous election. Although still many things depend on how things will go went on the 9th of August. As for the question about incorporating better policies, I think it's very likely that they will try imitating some things, that they will try to show something. The same as Artyom mentioned, I think that probably they will revive this idea of constitution. Probably they will abandon death penalty. By the end of the day, it's not a big deal to abandon it. So I think that they will try to do something, to show something, for example, to the EU, if they would like to revive their relations after this crackdown, after the future crackdown. So I think it's likely that they will try to imitate something. Thank you. Uh, there is another question for uh, Katerina Vernukova. Uh, it says that uh, Belarus is deeply integrated uh, with Russia in economic terms. And how much impact could any economic policy within Belarus uh, have, uh, regardless of, of which administration uh, is in office? And uh, whoever, um, yeah, and shouldn't Belarusians be aware of unrealistic economic expectations? And uh, wouldn't it be much more likely that Belarus will face same problematic economic paths as Bulgaria, Romania, or Ukraine after it orients towards the EU? Uh, well, thank you. That's a good question. Well, first of all, uh, almost no one is talking about reorientation towards the EU. And I mean, including the leading opposition candidates. Uh, second of all, Belarusians are very well aware of the Ukrainian state of events. Like uh, major state outlets are making them aware about all the shortcomings of the reforms there. So don't worry about that. Uh, now they are also aware about the successes of our neighbors like Poland and the Baltic states, right? Uh, as for the um, being the export-oriented economy, we not only see that the Russian market is not developing enough, we also see that uh, we are losing positions in this market due to different reasons. And it's the official government strategy, trade strategy right now, is to diversify, not necessarily towards the EU. It's both towards China, Asia, Africa, whatever. The U.S. finally, right? And I think there is an understanding uh, in the society that probably we want to build a, a dynamic economy based on our high human capital, our tech. Uh, we could do that, but we need to eliminate a lot of inefficient government things which are perceived as stupid by people and uh, that could be easily done even within this, uh, this government and this president. Anyone else wants to add? No? I see. Uh, all right. Okay. Um, uh, maybe we will take one more question. Uh, and here is uh, one. Uh, is there any chance that there will be substantial dissent among the military police forces? How will Lukashenko keep this sector satisfied enough to support him and impose a crackdown on citizens? Um, maybe Artem, let's start with you. And yeah. Okay. Well, history history teaches us then that this kind of these people, the Siloviki, the people in the law enforcement and special in security services, uh, they are usually loyal to the uh, regime that fits them well, and they do, are usually loyal unless they see a very uh, feasible and strong alternative actor uh, to whom they can shift their allegiance, or at least that uh, they, they, 
the power balance between the government and the opposition is so tight that it makes sense for personally for the Siloviki leadership to stay somewhat neutral in the crucial events. Nothing of this sort is happening in Belarus. The power imbalance is so obvious that uh, for any individual leader of uh, any law enforcement agency, the risks of not abiding uh, or even not or even not showing enough enthusiasm in abiding so overweigh the risks of uh, I don't know um, the, the the other you know part part of this equation. They, they, I don't expect any dissent spilling out into the reality. We have some anecdotal evidence and some anecdotal, let's say, r- not just rumors, but um, facts, that um, there are many people in the law enforcement, especially in the investigative um, bodies, uh, that were un- un- unpleased by how Lukashenko, for example, handled the pandemic. We know, for example, then on, on this infamous Tikhanovsky case where the blogger was arrested under rather bogus charges, uh, and now his criminal case is being investigated. We know that at least four investigators declined to investigate it before they found a fifth who agreed. But these are very small anecdotal evidence, and they do not suggest that on the X, uh, D-Day or X-Day or you know the day where the, their loyalty will be needed, they will somehow uh, fail to, to, to deliver it. Uh, and uh, that is why... Uh, first of all, uh, answering your questions, how will Lukashenko make these people happy is, I mean, very simply, by providing them the necessary uh, financial you know, incentives, but B, by eliminating all the potential alternatives for them to pick. Uh, because uh, if you don't have a strong opponent on the other side, I mean, to whom you will change your allegiance in the end. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, one last question, uh, which I find also very interesting. Maybe Katerina and Rehor uh, can comment on that too. Um, here it is. Do you predict an emigration wave after the elections and um, what what will it mean if it happens at all? Maybe in economic terms as well as um, okay. otherwise. So- Due to this uh, fact that I mentioned before that the incomes gap between uh, Belarus and our neighbors increases in the recent years, we already see increases in um, emigration. And certainly um, the disillusionment that many people feel right now may serve as a, a push towards to those who were, you know, deliberating whether to migrate or not. And we already see, well, recently, yesterday, actually, we saw one of the um, entrepreneurs announcing uh, his um, immigration from Belarus. And this is, of course, uh, a negative thing for the economy because our demography is uh, suffering as it is. And with the best people uh, leaving, of course, uh, that leaves the economy in a very fragile and bad place. Well, I think that actually it, it's unavoidable because salaries are low, the political situation is difficult, so the education system is failing. So in a way, it, the immigration was popular even before that. Now it stopped because actually because of the pandemic. And it's probably one of the reasons why so many people would like to participate in actions is that because they are at home while they're usually in Russia or in Poland working there, but now they have nothing to do because they're sitting just at home in Belarus. So I think it's unavoidable and more and more people will emigrate, unfortunately. Sure, go ahead. And there, there I think, also will be a wave of political migration as well. Uh, First of all, due to the crackdown, because this usually triggers the wave of immigration in 2006 and 2011, this was the case. And even some special, you know, sometimes scholarships were created to uh, accommodate the wave of Belarusian, I don't know, students who were expelled due to the political reasons. Um, but also, uh, there will be a large sense of hopelessness and frustration uh, if the crackdown is successful. And I already hear many members, let's say, of the Babarika team saying that if nothing changes on the 9th, meaning the 9th of August, I'll pack in my bags, basically. 
Uh, and I'm not saying that, I mean, all of them will do it. I mean, it's one thing to say, another thing to actually pack your bags. But some, some you know, way will be there. Thank you for, uh, for these answers. And I think we have to close here. I was hoping that the last question will be at least somewhat optimistic, more optimistic than, than the rest of it. But well, now I will try to conclude and um, say that uh, we spoke about uh, lots of different aspects and areas. Uh, we mentioned that uh, what is especially different for these elections uh, is that uh, the president, the current president, is much less popular than he was during all the previous rounds. And it also uh, makes a difference on how the protests go and, how the, and, and also on what the alternative candidates are. And uh, especially the pandemic also exacerbated the whole situation, not only politically, but also economically. The uh, Belarusian economy has already been um, on a downside. And uh, again, the pandemic uh, just worsened it. Um, well, and on the international level, it's also... A difficult situation, and as Artem said, it might be a lose-lose on both uh, sides after the elections. Neither the West nor Russia will be particularly happy about uh, um, about um, the um, foreign policy of Belarus, and what uh, none of them will give some carrots to Belarus afterwards. Um, well. What we can say is that uh, our international colleagues, diplomats uh, in the country and abroad can uh, follow and uh, uh, see what happens in Belarus. It's important since it's a neighboring country. And um, yeah, be updated, stay informed. And thank you very much for um, your participation in this discussion. And thank you to all the speakers. Um, I hope to see you someday also in person, hopefully soon. And have a good evening. Bye-bye.